Hi, I'm Clifford Carnicum, and I am an independent researcher. Many of you are familiar with my site under my name of Carnicum.com. I'm an independent researcher on what I call the aerosol issue, aerosol crimes, uh, popularly known or referred to as chemtrails. I don't use that term, but I don't have any problem with other folks that do that. But uh, for about 10 years, I've been doing research on the aerosol issue, the deliberate introduction of uh, massive amounts of particulates into our atmosphere. Our purpose here today is not to debate or discuss the reality of that subject. It, it is to go into a much deeper subject, and that is the biological consequences uh, of these aerosol operations with a particular interest in a condition that has emerged that has been called Morgellons. Um, we will find that as I use this term, really any time in the future, and, and as well as now, I will put that term in quotes, and I think that will become clear as we talk today. I'm here with Gwen Scott, uh, Dr. Gwen Scott, a naturopathic doctor, uh, a longtime uh, friend, associate, and collaborator on research uh, that we have done over, over 10 years now with uh, a great deal of recent activity over the last three months, specifically on, again, the Mergellans issue. What I'm going to do today is take about 10 minutes and simply make the audience aware of a series of papers that I have written I will not go into the in depth. I will not have time to go in depth. But I simply want to make the audience aware that these papers exist. The main subject of each paper that has evolved over the last three months. Uh, then Gwen will have some uh, time for some of her thoughts, uh, personal issues and testimony related to this issue. And then we'll have a couple of minutes at the end to, to close. So my work will basically be a chronology. And my work on this issue started in August of um, 2006 and there was an individual that presented physical samples to me of a skin condition along with the reports that wherever she went with these samples that she either received no information back from the doctors or that she was ridiculed or that she was called delusional. This is how this individual was treated. This apparently went on for several years. She sent me a sample because I could not really believe that somebody would not respond to a physical sample that she was providing. Apparently not the case. So I received the sample and I looked at this and I posted the first article on the subject. And that article uh, was called First Observations. And that was in uh, August, August of 2006. That work was posted rather phenomenal in terms of what it showed. It showed the presence of very unusual structures at the uh, submicron level under, under the microscope, things that had no uh, tie or continuity with normal biological processes, uh, submicron fiber networks. And at the same time, the, the term Morgellons was emerging uh, in more popular circulation about certain people that supposedly had a skin disease. And this is how it was framed as a subset, a small subset of the population that had this skin condition who, by the way, were generally be, being called delusional or, or crazy along the way. That work was posted along with an appeal uh, for positive identification of the unusual structures that were being seen under the microscope at high power. That call went completely unheeded for a full year or more. Nothing happened in terms of any response to identification of these unusual biological structures. At that time, this would have been in November of last year, a second individual provided me with samples in a much more direct form. I had access to the individual and numerous physical samples were provided. Those were also looked at in great detail under the microscope. And the, at that point, it was different because I had a match. I had only had the one sample from one individual for a whole year. At that point, when the second individual came in, I had numerous samples to look at, and there was an exact match to the T, an exact match with that first sample of a year ago. And in the end, there are about four basic forms that are showing up on, on my side under the microscope. They are as follows. One would be what I call an encasing filament or a, bound, a bounding filament, a filament that is usually barely visible to the human eye, but within it, a second structure exists, and that's a sub-micron network. So you have a bounding filament. A human hair is roughly on the order of 60 to 100 microns thick. 
this encasing filament is on the order of 12 to 20 microns. So you can see it with the visible light. It has, it has a similarity in appearance to a hair, but certainly you will find that it is not a hair when you look at it under proper magnification under the scope. So the second form is within the bounding filament, and this is a sub-micron network of fibers or filaments. The third form is that um, it's a coccus form, it appears. It appears to have strong similarities to what would be called a coccus bacterial form, uh, a spherical form. These structures are measuring at the sub-micron level also. Approximately a half to seven-tenths of a micron is the best size that I can come up with. And the fourth structure is what I'm right now calling a hybrid form. And this is something which is somewhat in between. It's somewhat of a transition between the filament and that uh, coccus form that I'm speaking of, although it's aligned more closely to the uh, filament form. It's just not uh, as long and not as irregular in its appearance. These are four basic forms which are appearing over and over and over. There is a chronology of papers on my site starting at that uh, period of November of last year up until literally a couple of weeks ago, which continues to examine different biological samples from numerous individuals. And the work is at the point now where you have samples coming across literally all of the major systems of the human body. Examples would be uh, uh, samples from the hair, uh, the scalp, um, uh, dental samples, which Gwen will talk uh, quite a bit about later. Uh, you have uh, the same filament, and actually all four forms exist. Three of them commonly occur in the outward manifestation of the body. That hybrid form is occurring primarily in the blood samples, it appears. Um, but you have a series of articles which continue to document the same forms over and over and over, crossing the, the hair, the uh, dental and gum uh, system of the body, saliva, um, the urinary tract, um, the ear, the blood, crossing all major um, functions of the human body. Now, the reason that this issue has come, in into, come into prominence is because not only has there been a finding of these, uh, unused, I call them pathogens, I can come up with no other term, than uh, that these are pathogens, these are in, invaders of the human body which cause uh, uh, ill health or, or certainly, um, I don't know how you can avoid the condition of calling it a disease in that sense, but Gwen and I have our own thoughts on this, but certainly the condition of the blood that I'm seeing over and over and over uh, is, not a, is not a healthy one. You have two things that are important here, I think, to identify. One would be that those individuals that were let's say segregated or classified as being something very an unusual segment of the population that had this condition called Morgellons, again in quotes, is plain false from what I can see. It is not, in the end, a small segment of the population that is to be isolated and segregated you know, as something unusual. In fact, the information and evidence is indicating that these same pathogenic forms, although they were originally found it is true that those individuals that were classified as having Morgellons, in, again in quotes, those individuals called these forms to attention. This is where it first was examined, because you had something physical manifesting outside of the body, skin for example. So it is true that these individuals called attention to the problem. However, when you start looking at those same conditions that were, were arrived at within that individual, it is seen that these same physical conditions are applying themselves, it appears, to the entire, or let's say to the general population. It's hard to avoid that conclusion right now. We have, you know, 18 individuals across uh, three to four state lines that have contributed physical samples thus far, and the same identical pathogenic forms, again, I can come up with no other proper term than that they are a pathogen, uh, are occurring in these individuals. And the only distinction that I can make with the so-called Morgellons individual is that you simply have an outward or visible manifestation or visible form um, with that individual. But if you get into the blood and you get inside the body in these major systems, the same forms are occurring with all. Okay. So that's certainly one of the main points that I wanted to make 
in terms of the, the distribution of this condition. The classification of Morgellons as something specific to a few individuals appears to be entirely false. And the only conclusion I can come to at this point is that it certainly appears that the general state of health of the general population um, has been affected or degraded by the presence of these pathogens. The next important point that needs to be made is the connection with the aerosol issue. At, at, from one perspective, a person could simply examine the so-called Morgellons condition, and you have a field day in itself in terms of trying to explain what it is that you're seeing. That's a valid subject in itself which deserves a whole lot more uh, attention than it's received thus far. But unfortunately, there has been the linking by direct physical evidence of the so-called Morgellons condition with airborne samples that now have a history extending back 10 years. In particular, a set of samples that was sent to the United States Environmental Protection Agency at the beginning of my work, close to be in 1999 or 2000, and the subsequent refusal of the United States Environmental Protection Agency to identify that material. If you now look at the uh, microscopic level, very high magnification, you will find a direct parallel in form, structure, and size between that very sample that the EPA refused to identify. Basically, three out of those four, four forms that I spoke of, you will see within that single sample that the EPA refused to identify. And so obviously, the, the problem here is that it appears as though there is a direct link between um, environmental contaminants um, and environmental samples and the subsequent biological manifestations that are occurring, not only within a certain class of individuals that have been given a name, but unfortunately it looks like they extend themselves through the general population. I'm going to pass right now um, this subject over to Dr. Scott um, to give her a time for her thoughts and then at the end we'll come back for a couple minutes and also I wanted to mention that I hope that in the future we can have a couple more sessions like this but I wanted to open the door and at least get some general information out there because there, there's actually indications that even the alternative press in some ways is not being let's say quite um, um, as open in the disclosure of some of the information as I think might be helpful to us. So Gwen I wanted to thank you very much for being uh, here today. Um, this time we're both under the camera. Last time we did some work with just you under the camera. Sure. But I wanted to thank you for being here and give you a few minutes to give some of your thoughts on this issue. And thank you very much. Well, I have to thank you. And I think every human on this planet, Clifford, has to thank you. You spent nothing but the last 10 years of your life with nothing coming to you doing this work. So on behalf of humanity, thank you. And thank also you. your beautiful wife, who's been patient unbelievably right. throughout this process. Right. Thank you. Um, uh, dovetailing what Clifford was saying, this is not a disease, folks, uh, and that's, that's a terrible misleading that's going on to Morgellons disease. I've been working with this, com it, it, well, it's a network of things for a couple of three years now. At first I had no clue what I was working with, using my own body basically as a laboratory. And I began to see that there are a lot of components. Uh, Morgellons was just a name put on this because people were demonstrating something through their skin, as Clifford mentioned, which later under the microscope we begin to see very unusual forms. But it is a very compound, complex network of pathogens, organic, inorganic, and all kinds of things. Uh, fibers, we have heavy metals, we have bacterias, funguses, viruses, all kinds of things that seem to be working somehow synergistically uh, none of none of them good to the human body and human health. Um, I did. I was able to touch base with one of the people who actually was involved in the design of some of this, and I think at the time he thought he was doing his country some good, uh, and in retrospect now realizes perhaps not. And so he's trying very hard to help anybody who's conscious of what's going on and. He did tell me uh, that most of these pathogens have been genetically altered. 
so that some uh, your immune system doesn't even know that they're there. Uh, they're, they're cloaked. Uh, they're, they're different. They can overcome. And um, I won't go into specifics, but just to say these are not your average bacteria, virus, fungus, and uh, of course heavy metals are not average in the human body anyway. And these fibers, these unusual fibers are wires that we're seeing. Uh, people have said, well, where is it coming from? Well, clearly uh, there's been enough air sample to know, and Mr. Karnak on Clifford just made that connection for us, through the air. And remember, folks, and this is something people forget, we've sort of disconnected. Hopefully we can reconnect with some very important things today. Um, whatever you breathe in is systemic or system-wide to your whole body in less than a minute. And these things that we're talking about here are very small, tiny, tiny, tiny particles goes into the lungs, go directly into the blood supply. No oversight, uh, nobody knows, you know, this is a slow process of discovery, can be changed on any given day without our permission or knowledge. So it's pretty disturbing when you think about it. But we do know that some of these at least are coming into us with deliberation through the air supply. Uh, I have been told by this same gentleman that it is also be, be being delivered to us through our food supply, particularly um, commercial uh, pre-processed, pre pre-produced foods, something to think about in terms of your diet. And also I have a personal belief, I have no proof, that perhaps through inoculation, a uh, willing inoculation for many years, um, that while well, I say willing, we were sort of told we had to get all those inoculations, but anyway. So there you go. Um, one of the things I think that is most disturbing about these times that even the people who are conscious or aware, if they're not demonstrating fibers coming out of their bodies, they go, well, I'm sorry for those people, but it's not me. What I'm discovering along with Clifford over time here is that every single human that goes through a series of sampling and testing seems to have this condition. I, I don't even want to call it Morgellons. It's a compound complex assault on the body. One of the couple of things in that, you know, by law, as a naturopathic doctor, uh, I cannot diagnose or prescribe to you. But what I can do is educate you and share some of my own personal experiences. And one of those was I had a very, what I thought, bad, bad toothache one day. Um, it was so bad, I kind of went under the covers and said, help, <laughs> to the higher kingdom. And it came to me that rinsing my mouth with red wine, red wine, would help. And I did, and the results of that were astounding, uh, terrifying, and stupefying. Uh, all of these fibers came flying out, and you can see that work on Mr. Carnicom, Carnicom.com website. You can see the photographs. That was probably two months ago, and to this day, twice a day, I do that, I do that therapy. Uh, and it continues to produce, perhaps not as much, but thousands and thousands and thousands uh, from the, the, the chin, the teeth, the gums. Uh, and that's something, clearly, if, you, if you're interested, um, what I do is I put a little peroxide around the teeth and gums and I use a little bit of dental floss to kind of get it in there. And then I vigorously swish one side of the mouth five or six or seven times and then move to the other. First swishing usually doesn't produce very much, but by the second or third swishing. This is not a recommendation or a cure or anything like that, uh, but a simple in-home thing that you can do, test to see if perhaps you too might have some of this going on. Another something that you can do is take your own body temperature. Uh, one thing that has been noticed is that uh, without exception, every human I have met, when they take a consistent body temperature testing every day, falls way below the normal 98.6 that we're supposed to be. Uh, there are people who are down in the 94, 95 range consistently. But most everyone, if not everyone, whose temperature uh, we take ends up being very, very low. And that's something else you can do in indicating that perhaps things are a little crooked. The reason I think this is important is if not for yourself, okay, say you don't care about yourself, but I know you love somebody, you have children, you have a mom or a dad, a brother or a sister. You know, you can just sort of look away or do the ostrich thing, but believe me, whether you and yours are dealing with the chemtrails, the aerosol spraying or not, 
it's dealing with you. And if we don't begin to accept that as difficult as it is, and for most people of consciousness and good heart, it's inconceivable that anyone would want to harm uh, their fellow man that way by coming to the uh, recognition that perhaps they, there are some folks who do, and for what reason I have no clue, um, then you have to somehow enjoin. You have to somehow decide that it, it, that it, it is touching your life and, and in a big way. Um, ways that I have noticed and been able to sort of track uh, through myself and friends and family and clients is a sort of a premature aging, and that affects every body part. Um, hair loss, all kinds of things, joint pains. And as I go along on the discovery, I'm beginning to understand that more and more of what we associate with aging and ill health can be directly related back to this system, um, this very kind of compound complex mix that's coming into us, all of them taking tolls on one in one way or another. Um, if you are working, and I do suggest that you do, work with an enlightened uh, practitioner, it's very important that they understand that we have a new paradigm, health paradigm that we're working with now, and they need to become educated about all of the things coming into us. And uh, if you go to Mr. Karnakam's website, I did post a paper there, a very extensive paper about my own personal journey through this, and in there, there are some suggestions, please not on your own, but work with an enlightened practitioner. Um, take, you're welcome to take any of that information to him or her uh, to, to help you and yours achieve optimum health. Just a few final comments. Everybody says to me, well, okay, what do I do? <laughs> well, I think the first thing you do is what you're doing right now is becoming aware. Uh, educating yourself, becoming conscious, because knowledge is always the beginning. And then after that, follow your your soul, follow your spirit, um, go and meditate, do whatever it is that you need to do, because everybody can contribute uh, something positive um, to the to these times. So you'll have to find what your journey is and what your contribution could be. I would only say to you to do nothing. Um, is, it would be sad because every contribution means something. And I would also say it's, it's hard not to get angry. It's hard not to come right back at it with, uh, well, anger and hatred and they should, you know, whatever and all that stuff. But in my opinion, um, that it's that energy that got us where we are right now, um, and that, that even though this is so difficult to approach this way, to me it seems the only way, which is with love and compassion and um, kindness and all the light side energy, um, because in the end it's the most powerful, and uh, I think can offset. Uh, the same person that came to me said so much of what's going on is vibrational. Um, and. If you look at Mr. Karnakon Clifford's website, you'll see a lot about frequencies. And we know that anger and hatred and judgment all carry a very dense negative frequency, whereas love like compassion carries a different frequency. So that in and of itself is good medicine. Um, as I go along through this process with myself and my friends and my clients, I will continue to update whatever observations I have about the nature and potential mitigating uh, natural remedies that you can uh, consider. As I said, please work with a professional healthcare practitioner. And uh, in closing here, really, I just want to say anybody watching this, bless you. Bless you for being conscious and bless you for caring. And uh, I know Mr. Karnakam Clifford has a few Closing thoughts. Yeah, I just want to uh, thank you very much, Gwen. And you know, I hope we get the chance to meet again uh, soon on this. And I suspect um, it might be helpful to have just more of a dialogue, maybe the next time. But it's helpful to get some of the really just introductory. We're just trying to raise the issue uh, on this. And uh, you know, one comment that with respect to this um, test that Gwen described with the, the wine. Unfortunately, this is not an anomaly. This does not appear something to be something that is extremely unusual. 
Uh, it's unusual what, what is being seen, but this is not something restricted to a single individual. What has happened thus far in the tests that she has described, this is very real that we're speaking of, and this is why we're, we're presenting this in, in a video. This is real, this is physical. And thus far there have been 18 people is our latest count, right? 18 people. We could essentially call this a random sample from across the country, numerous states now, have have conducted this very same test. And I'm not a doctor at all, and I don't claim to be a doctor in any way. And I'm not offering a cure. In fact, we don't know one-tenth, one-hundredth of what is going on. But we do know that there is a specific physical test that has been established. Gwen is the one that discovered this. And thus far, on essentially a random sample of 18 people across the country, every single one of them, every single one of them is producing the same physical forms, which I must declare the best that I can as being a pathogenic form. These are not meant to be in the human body, what is being seen here. I'm not going to swear that every single person across the country and in the general population has this, but certainly, statistically, we're way beyond any norm. So I would like the audience to become involved to the point where they are aware that this is a physical manifestation which appears as though it may be affecting the general population, not something that we shove off to being a few folks like they treated lepers in the past. I also want to um, let it be known how the CDC has responded to this issue. And if we're counting on the federal government to and the federal agencies to give us the, the scoop and the lowdown on this issue, we've got a very serious problem. Because if you look at the CDC's uh, history here, they have been anywhere from completely ignoring the issue. They've taken several tactics, several along the way, and they change according to what appears to be appropriate for them at the time. One is complete refusal and denial to even acknowledge the subject. The next stage they got into was one of uh, labeling the, the condition as delusional. They put it up on their website that this is a delusion, falling right in line, again, with a tactic that was used. Then there appeared to have been pressure applied to that agency, and they removed the delusional reference and, and acknowledged that such a thing might exist in some form, but we don't know anything about it, that we're going to do a study, but nothing happened. This was on for at least a year and a half. They declared an intent, nothing happens. It then evolves to the point where there's a press club, a national press club, where there's an acknowledgement of the issue. And what do they do there? They say that we're going to study this. There's no sufficient funds established for a study. The study is, is confined to a specific group of people with a specific health organization, you know, Kaiser Health Organization, a very specific test. And who's the um, main scientific um, uh, let's say arbit arbitrator of this, the, the Armed Forces Institute of Pathology. Okay? This is who is supposedly evaluating the, the reality of this condition will be the military. So, and now we're at the point where there supposedly will be some information released a year and a half on this specific group of people. So if we're counting on the CDC or the general press to um, help us circulate information. There's obviously a problem. This is one of the reasons that Gwen and I are together here. On, on my side, there is a very, um, there is a call for an appeal for assistance for positive identification. A lot of my work is specific uh, under the microscope. It's not something that's nebulous. There are very specific forms that are repeatedly showing up now. And they need positive identification. Not, uh, not a maybe, not might be. We need positive uh, uh, microbiological uh, description, identification of what's there. And if it's a little bit beyond the ordinary, we need to know that as well. And, and my hope is that we're able to meet again, Gwen, and maybe just in a more um, conversational mode, go over some of the yeah. things that we're finding. And, and fi uh, what I would want to say is please, 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 this isn't something you let somebody else take care of if you do not become involved if you look back through human history and when there was a big problem afoot and you and the people turned away now we condemn them and say well why didn't they do something well we've got another big problem here and it may and i i hope i'm not overstating but <clears throat> i think the health and survival of all human beings is truly at stake here and so we can't afford 
to say, well, I'm busy today or I got family problems or, ooh, that's scary, I don't want to get involved. You really, um, it's a soul call out. <laughs> I don't think it's an exaggeration and that's why, you know, Gwen and I are motivated um, to, to do this. Um, we're speaking of something which has the potential, if not actually already doing so, and that is affecting the general state of the health of the population. On the whole and, planet. Yes, and, and with a great deal of evidence uh, can be attributed to, to um, very specific uh, environmental operations and programs yes. that are being conducted. And, and with that, uh, I would like to thank you for listening and thank you, Gwen. And I look forward to meeting with you soon again and see if we can get into a little more detail on some of the things we've been doing. Peace and blessings. Thank you, Mike.